Joel, come on in and get seated, please. We're going to get started. Anybody? No? And we're going to do Kumbaya and say Amen. We're here. You know, that's good. <laughs> speaker here. Okay. Um, it's time has arrived, so everybody is prepared. I guess Greg is absent today. He's not here today. Nick, you're the unusual one to be gone. We'll call the uh, first meeting of the 2009 year for the Planning and Zoning Commission together. And it's customary, the first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Then the day, a lot's happened since our last meeting and across the country, so we're here to catch up. Uh, first, really, the first order of business tonight is we've got three new members on the commission, like Pilar Turner and Dr. David Cox, and my main man, Mr. Tripson, down here, Jen Tripson. Um, welcome aboard, and we look forward to serving with you, and welcome back those who uh, returned. Um, the Next item is customary also in our first meeting of the year as we elect a, a chairman and a vice chairman. So we've got a substitute attorney tonight. The, hi, the hierarchy is here. Mr. DeBrule, if you'd take over, we'd appreciate it. Thank you for the Phil, I'm a little frisky tonight. It's been cold, you know. Thank you for the kind words. <laughs> uh, like Mr. Hamner said, the first order of business in any meeting of a board or committee uh, in January, the first meeting in January is the election of a chairman. A uh, simple procedure, all I do is at this point open the floor for nominations for position as chair. I'd right. like to make a nomination, please. Ms. Keyes. Um, Craig Fletcher is not with us this year. Uh, he was our chair, our vice chair last year, so normal procedure is that he would probably be elected as chair. So since we don't have Craig this year and we have a lot of new people, I'd like to elect George Hamner or nominate George Hamner as chair this year with Greg Smith as vice chair. I'll second that. Well, thank you, all those in favor. Can we, can we, should we split them apart, Bill? Your nomination would be for the chair only, okay. and then the gavel will pass okay. to the elected chair. Okay, I change my motion to nominate George Havner as chair. Okay, we, and there I was second second. we've got a second, and there was a second. All, all, and I move the closed nominations. Are there any other nominations? I move the closed nominations. All, all those in favor, give a great retching sound. Call the vote. Aye. 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 Congratulations, Mr. Hammer. Thank you. Uh, next item is a vice chairman. Um, in as uh, if we have nominations for vice chairman. Yes, I'd like to nominate Greg Smith as vice chair. I'll second that. Okay. Any other nominations for vice chair? I move, I move you close nominations. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Okay. Well. You don't have to live through another year. I'm sorry. And poor well, Greg's not even here. I know. <laughs> Greg doesn't know how many meetings I'm going to miss. Now, so. um, next item is approval of the minutes from December 11. Move approval. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. In case the new members don't understand, we're, we've got uh, the, uh, if you've gone through the items on consent, the procedure is normally if you want to discuss one, we'll pull it. If not, they would be approved accordingly. Would anyone care to pull an item um, on consent? Move approval of consent agenda. Okay, I'll, with a sec, upon a second, I'll read them into the. Second. We're, second. we're getting there. 
I hadn't heard a second, but second. I thought Jen's was oh, David Dr. Cox seconded. Jen's had his mouth open. I wasn't sure if he was yawning or. Uh, we've got uh, two items on consent. One is Dr. Dan's Animal Hospital, a request for administrative permit use approval for a veterinary clinic, hospital, and commercial shopping center known as Dr. Dan's Animal Hospital. The second is uh, 53rd Street, US 1 Commercial Subdivision, a request for a preliminary plat approval for a commercial subdivision to be known as 53rd Street, US 1 Commercial Subdivision. And they have been approved. All right. uh, public hearings. We have three tonight. Um, first item is the Roberts Family Daycare. This is a request for a special exception use approval for a child care facility to be known as Fan Roberts Family Daycare. Since we have a, a large audience that I suspect are here for this item and maybe not the next two items, I'll tell you what we'll do is we listen to the staff's proposal first. They tell us what they recommend. We ask questions of staff and we'll ask questions of the um, applicant and then I'll open the meeting for public hearing. Um, usually I'll work around the room and then we'll close it and we'll have our vote. Okay. Um, let's see, was this, oh, you know what, read I, these are, it looks like we, this is the only quasi-judicial item. This item is quasi-judicial, so if you're going to make testimony, because it's like a court in this, that sense, please stand and be sworn by our secretary. If you're going to speak publicly to this item, you need to be sworn. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Um, okay. Who's John or Stan? Who's got this? I didn't look. I handled this. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations. Mm -hmm. For the record, I'm Stan Bowling, County Planning Director. I uh, wanted to welcome the new members uh, as well. And just a, one little bit of housekeeping. If you, if you haven't gotten used to the, the dais or the, the new dais, you want to make sure that you're microphone is on, you've got the green button on, and you don't get too close to these, uh, to these microphones. Uh, the request before you tonight on this particular item is a special exception use request. That means it will come before you all here at this public hearing and you'll make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners and they'll take final action. This particular request is for a small scale uh, child care facility and it's located in a residential zoning district. This is the location map of the subject site and to the to the north of the site uh, running east and, uh, and west is Highland Drive. This is in the Vero Beach Highlands in the south part of the county and you can see that this site is uh, basically a little bit more than one block away from uh, Highlands Drive. And it is a single-family uh, platted lot in the Highlands. And because it's zoned residential single-family, uh, a daycare center is a special exception use. This is an aerial of the site. And in fact, the, the daycare use uh, has been going on at the site uh, for a while. And it's essentially grown over the years. And it's, it's beyond the threshold of, uh, of what's allowed simply as accessory to a single-family. And that's why they're here for special exception approval to legalize uh, the use at its current uh, capacity. You can also see on this aerial that there is a there's a playground uh, area that's that's in the rear of the property itself, and it will be accessed yeah. off of a local road. A couple of things that I wanted to, to emphasize: one is that there's a maximum capacity set with this a particular application at 16 uh, children. Uh, there is a parking paved parking that's required and, and proposed of uh, three spaces. Two are on this site, and an additional one is on uh, an adjacent site to the west. There's been uh, written authorization for that. I did want to say that the operator of this child care uh, facility lives on the site themselves and have been operating uh, in that neighborhood for a while. There's also a proposed loading and unloading area with a one-way drive and a landscape buffer with a six-foot open feature, which and the feature consists of an existing wood fence around the rear property. It's fairly similar to some of the other kind of small scale uh, daycares you all have uh, seen or the Planning Zoning Commission has seen within the last year and a half. Uh, north is toward the, uh, the upper part of this graphic. There are two existing trees out front in the right of way. Those will remain and a loop driveway will be put in to make for an easier drop off. Uh, 
required spaces are off here to, to the west. The uh, playground area is in the rear, and there's an existing wood fence. Uh, the rear is to the right now on this, this graphic. Uh, existing <coughs> six-foot uh, wood fence, and the landscaping will be <coughs> or augmented what's already there around the outside of that. So the play area will be in the back and will be, will be screened. There will also be landscape improvements up front uh, in between the proposed driveway and the existing, the existing road. There are specific land use criteria that's outlined in staff's report for this type of use, and all of the land use criteria are met uh, with this particular type of uh, application. And again, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, can approve the opaque feature using the wood fence. In this particular case, as we pointed out in the item, that's consistent with some of the privacy fencing that's in the neighborhood, so the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, can, uh, can approve that as part of this plan. Staff's recommendation is that the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, grant, uh, recommend that the board approve this special exception request with the conditions outlined in our report. And those conditions include a limitation to 16 children uh, at the facility, the installation of the required buffers, uh, and also some water and sewer improvements that are required uh, by the utilities department. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have. Does anybody have any questions of staff? If, if not, I have two quick. Have, what is, you know, the, we have always have the same question. First question always on these is stacking. Is the drive, are we talking, do you think we're looking at five, four cars, five cars? Right. I think in. I mean, in, I'm, with 16 kids, what, maybe eight or nine cars total? Right. I, I think that the, the operator can talk about some, some of the operational characteristics because, again, they've actually been operating this facility at this capacity now, even without that driveway. Uh, and we've seen for these small scale, we've seen these, you know, kind of short circular driveways work with the parking right off. And they kind of stagger it to make it work. Were there any comments or com concerns from the neighbors? Did you have any calls? We have not had any calls uh, in opposition. We've had several um, to to basically support the application, and I think there sounds like there are a number of supporters here this evening. The only other one was the was the wooden fence a cost issue? Because you know we have tried diligently for the last seven or eight years to get away from wooden fences. No, I, and I agree. And and the reason why that takes approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission is it some is of the, the parents over time and maintenance. In this case, it's an existing wood fence. We think it's probably less disruptive to have that removed than to keep it in place right now. It's in good repair now. And is consistent with the with the rest of the neighborhood, okay. and the Planning Zoning Commission has approved those. We've types done it before. In the past. You're right. So I think that would be consistent. I have a question on the fence too, Stan. Will there be landscaping required on the outside of the fence, or is it landscaping on, uh, the fence on the property line? Right. The the fence is on the property line, so it's there's really the not line. an opportunity to put it on the outside. Uh, there will be a lot of the landscaping will be understory and canopy trees, which actually will get will be oh, higher. Yeah. Than, than that six foot opaque feature, so they will help the neighborhood. But one of the things, especially with these small care, you, you really wouldn't want to over improve the site in a sense and make it look like something different than a single right. family I, home. I, so I would be hesitant to, to, I'm almost hesitant to shrink much of the backyard yeah. with, uh, yeah. with, with a lot of shrubbery, even though it, you know, we may, criteria may require it, but the trees and taller items might work fine. Stan? Donna, I'm, wait, David, Donna had a question, I thought. Uh, yes, Stan, you indicated in here that one of the parking requirements is being met by the use of the adjacent property. Correct. How, how do you keep that going in perpetuity? I, I don't understand that. Right. There's, there's an agreement allowance in our parking ordinance. You can have up to half of your spaces on an adjacent property. And in this case, the adjacent property next door, we've gotten written permission, or they've obtained, the applicants obtained written permission. And they have a pretty large driveway next door. They can actually get four cars uh, in that existing, you know, paved driveway next door. And so uh, it, it, seemed to, it seemed to be an opportunity to work that allowance in the parking code for this situation. What happens if that neighbor to the west sells the property and the school no longer has access to that parking spot? Right. The county could require uh, an access easement, you know, a formal recorded easement that that's something that could be required. But I mean, that would be if that fell if if that fell away in the future, 
Would, would, would the county then would have the right to reevaluate the whole situation and right. make, other, take action then rather than doing it tonight? Right. In other words, a, a, uh, there could be a condition attached to this approval that if that, that permission is rescinded or what have you, that they'd have to provide a makeup space on site or even on another adjacent site would be a possibility. Okay. Without that parking spot, what would the limitation be on the number of children in the school? Well, I think I think it's it's critical to to meet that requirement because the the requirement is one and a half spaces for every staff person, and there's one staff person in you know that lives in the house, and I think for for 16 children they would need to have two staff people under the state requirement. So I think it's really important that they they be able to have extra car that that extra have space. those th that three space requirement met. How many could they have with only one staff person? How many children? I think. It depends on the ages and so forth, but I think eight is, is my understanding. Uh, Dr. Dave. Yeah. Back to the fence stand. Um, get, get a little closer. Not, not, on the yeah, site not, plan. Is it on? Is it on? Put, yes, yeah, it on. is. Mm -hmm. right. On the site plan, it shows that um, remove existing fence in, the, in this area. That's in the, that's in the front yard. Um, the six-foot fence does go in front of the front of the house. So is that the portion of the fence that will be removed by the carport or the, the, the parking area? Right, up in the, kind of the northwest area. So that'll will that be removed back to yes. the front edge of the house so it will be in compliance? That, that's correct. And the, uh, the requirement there uh, for a six-foot fence or the, or the code is that it not be within that first 20-foot setback at that height. It, had, it and would that, have to be at four. When that's they, correct. Right. You're exactly right. So that, that'll, that'll and, and I didn't want to just kind of emphasize that the whole entire rear will be secured, you know, with the fence. Okay. Anyone else? Um, how, yes. Um, how many days a week? Is it five? Yeah, I, I believe that it, five. it's five now, and I believe that's the intent. And, and normal business hours? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Would the applicant care to be heard? Come forward and make a brief key word here is free <laughs> presentation. You gotta love them. Is this good? That's fine, yeah. Just, just make sure you're close. Yeah, that sounds. You're, you're My name's Lois Edwards, and I'm the agent for uh, Hattie and Charles Roberts. I'd like to introduce Hattie and Charles Roberts. Come on. You sure you want this? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Very much. You look so young. <laughs> you want to age. <laughs> uh, they operate their daycare facility under the name of Robert's Family Home. Uh, the daycare facility is located at 865 uh, 23rd Place Southwest in Vero Highlands. Um, I've reviewed the staff report, and we certainly appreciate staff's conclusion that all specific land use criteria has been satisfied. And we also appreciate staff's recommendation to the Planning and Zoning Commission that this project be recommended for approval by the Board of County Commissioners. I want to ensure that the Commission understood that Hattie Roberts has been operating a daycare center out of her home since 1995. Um, this is not a new daycare facility. Um, and I want to elaborate just a little bit for you to pull the pieces together. In 1995, HRS issued a license to Hattie to open the child care facility. And, and the license allowed Hattie to care for up to a maximum of six children at her residence. There was no modification to the home required at that time. Hattie was required to obtain from, um, at that time it was Indian River Community College, training in uh, food, nutrition, and infant care. And she also obtained the required county occupational license. In 2005, um, Hattie elected to expand her child care business operating out of her home. And she was very diligent in going about obtaining what she thought was all of the education and required state and county licenses so that she could increase the number of children to care for in her home from 6 to 16. Last summer, Hattie was cited by the county for a home occupation violation, and that's Code Chapter 912, Section 912.05, Print 6. Hattie and Charles desire to come into compliance with county codes and continue to operate the child care facility that they have been operating since 1995. I want to note that um, Hattie's facility has never had a complaint registered or a code violation until this came up last summer. Um, unfortunately, Hattie was unaware of the county requirements when she did increase her children. Um, 
to increase her children, uh, Hattie had a number of state criteria that she had to meet. Um, Florida Administrative Code Child Care Standards Chapter 65C22.002 is uh, for outdoor play area, and that states that there must be a minimum of 45 square feet of usable, safe, and sanitary playground um, area per child, and currently the existing facility exceeds that requirement. Uh, the same code, another section for indoor floor space, requires that in order for uh, Hattie to operate with 16 children, she must have a minimum of 35 square feet of indoor, usable indoor floor space for each child with the maximum of 16, that is 560 square feet. Um, currently, the facility provides 570 square feet. That floor space is dedicated solely to the children, and in this case, it constitutes their, their play area, their lunch area, and the baby's room. The Florida Department of Children and Family just completed their annual inspection to relicense re this facility in December, and her license is now uh, revalidated until December 14th, 09. Um, the license specifically identifies the maximum number of children allowed there, and again, that is 16. Uh, in conjunction with obtaining this license renewal, there are a myriad of um, inspections by other departments, and specifically, and probably most importantly, the fire department and the health department. Uh, the only outstanding improvements for the existing facility are the improvements that are going to be required by the county for this special exception use. Um, and that is, as was described, landscape parking <coughs> and driveway improvements. Our site plan and our application for these, site, uh, for these improvements have been approved by county staff, but it is subject to county board of commission approval of the special exception use request. We've obtained a um, conditional con uh, concurrence, concurrency certificate for the existing facility. Um, the Roberts are certainly prepared to move forward with the required improvements upon county commission approval. Um, there were, as was stated, there was no inquiries or any pub comments as a result of the posted sign that Hattie still has in her front yard and the uh, county's uh, public notice. I did obtain, um, or I should say Hattie obtained, eight letters of support from her immediate neighbors. And I know you all are busy, but I wanted to share with you one that caught my eye. And this lady is uh, Jennifer Williams, and she lives in the back uh, adjacent to the playground area, so I'm confident she did a lot of things during the day. The Roberts family are very good neighbors. We see each other a few times during the week, and they always say hello. I am one who works nights, and so I am, I am one who has an opportunity to be in my backyard while the children and Hattie are outside playing. As a parent of two, I'm very confident in saying she's a good child care provider. I can hear just how happy the children are and how professional Hattie is in handling all of their needs. You will be um, making the proper decision on improving all forms and documents so that Hattie may stay open at her residence for business. P.S. I also work with one of her students' parents. This parent says no nothing but good things about how clean the house is and how happy her daughter is. Um, I also want to let you know Hattie cares for a number of disadvantaged children who qualify for daycare subsidy under the Indian River Coalition program. She routinely extends her um, services at reduced cost to families, uh, special need families. And right now, uh, there's a lot of families financially struggling with their jobs, and she works with them so they can continue to come to her place with their children. Um, Hattie raises families of children. Um, she took care of my granddaughter. She's 10 years old. She started taking care of her at eight months. When she comes to visit, we go see Hattie. She's currently taking care of my grandson, Devin, who's uh, four years old. She's had him since he was six weeks old. Um, I went into Hattie's the other day to pick up Devin, and there's little Austin, little four-month-old baby. Um, he just lights up the room when you walk in. Hattie took care of his 14-year-old sister and his nine-year-old brother. So there are no words to express the relief that the parents that you're seeing in this room that we all share knowing that Hattie loves and cares for the children and her grandchildren like they're her own. Um, we've had to participate in numerous uh, fundraising events to get 
to you all today. Um, the neighbors and the parents have assisted in uh, yard sales, car washes, you name it, we've done it, cookie sales. Um, we have commitments from parents, neighbors, and, and business, uh, businesses that are going to donate labor, plants, and the concrete to conduct the improvements. The community support is a direct result of Hattie and Charles' commitment to their business and the children that they care for daily. Mm -hmm. We request respectfully that you make a recommendation of approval for this request so that Hattie and Charlie can continue to operate this facility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions of the Roberts or was it Linda? No, what was your Hattie. name? Hattie and I'm Lois. Lois, Lois, Lois I'm sorry. Of, of Lois? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank we appreciate you. it. There are no questions of them or staff. I will open the public hearing. After that kind of accolade, I, would anyone care to speak against this? If everyone is in favor of this, then would anyone, has anyone got a burning desire to speak? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. I think I, my, our assumption, my assumption is it looks like all of you all are here in favor of it. Your kids are being just wonderful. This is, speaks well of Hattie on top of everything else. So. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Um, it's time to take action. So, anyone has a motion or any other questions of staff? Motion to approve with staff recommendations. We've got a motion for approval as recommended by staff. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Tripson seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, like, sign. Congratulations, Hattie. Uh, be careful what you wish for, darling. <laughs> Keep up the good work. I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to impart or have a pro, create a problem with the celebration. But we have two or three more items. So, if you could take those wonderful kids and families and kind of move to the door, we would appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. No, we're, no breaks tonight, guys. No breaks tonight. We don't believe in breaks. Oh, come on. Um, next next item up is uh, the Falcon Trace PD uh, request for a conceptual plan development special exception use approval for a project to be known as Falcon Trace Phase 3 Indian River Associates 2 LLP owner Knight and McGuire and Associates Inc. agent um, John is this you? Yes it is thank you Mr. Hamner this is a request for special exception use approval, and the reason special exception use approval is required is because the applicant is looking to modify some of the parameters of the zoning code. And with the special exception use approval, when folks are requesting that, it requires two public hearings, the first before you all and the second before the Board of County Commissioners. And we uh, put out signs, we send out letters, we put an ad in the paper, and you all are supposed to make a recommendation to the Board, and the Board takes final action on the uh, special exception use request. As far as the location of this particular site, it's located at the southeast corner of 27th Avenue Southwest and 21st Street Southwest. And the aerial shows the uh, site and the surrounding site. And there is a little bit of history with this. The overall project, which is what you see developed to the north and the parcel to the south, were all approved as a small lot subdivision. Construction commenced on the northern part, homes were built, and then construction commenced on the southern part, and the application expired. Well, the applicant could not get the small lot subdivision approval extended without committing to the new requirements of the small lot subdivision, which require that the small lot subdivision be uh, provide affordable housing and be linked to affordable housing, and the applicant wanted to do essentially a market rate uh, development. So they had to go back through the PD process in order to get uh, the development reapproved, and that's the process they're in now. And the process that they're uh, in is to get the development reapproved very much like it was previously approved, same basic layout, same number of lots, those sorts of items. This is a <clears throat> 
a picture of the proposed development. It's 135 acres, proposes 258 units, the same as the previous plan, and uh, just a little under two units per acre. As far as the stormwater plan goes, the stormwater will <coughs> be collected in uh, the lakes that are constructed, treated, and then outfall to the south. One of the items I'd like to tell you about on the stormwater plan is the county is looking for an easement from them so we can take runoff from 20th Avenue improvements that the county is now undertaking with the widening of 20th Avenue and have it treated in their stormwater system so they'll accommodate our stormwater and then it will ultimately outfall to a canal south of the subject site. The uh, traffic plan is fairly uh, complete. All the off-site improvements have been completed with the exception of the access to this point and some 20th Avenue <coughs> improvements, which have been bonded. The access is shown at the northern end that have a single lane inbound and dual egress lanes, and there'll be an emergency access at the southeast corner of the project. As far as the proposed PD waivers, and this is what the special exception use request is required for, the uh, applicant is uh, proposing waivers that are consistent, basically the same as the small lot subdivision, which is what they had approved previously. So they're looking for reduced side yards, which is consistent with the uh, small lot subdivision, reduced rear yard. Their proposed lots are actually going to be larger than what would be allowed in a typical small lot subdivision, and their lots will be a little bit wider. They're looking for a little bit greater building coverage and the same amount of open space. So those are the dimensional criteria that they're modifying through the PD process. And it, again, it's, it's consistent with the exception of the, the maximum lot coverage being a little bit greater, consistent with what a small lot subdivision would be allowed. As far as the buffer plan goes, the line you see in green is a 25-foot type B buffer that consists of a berm and landscape to form a six-foot opaque feature. The gray area you see in the southern portion is preserved vegetation that ranges from 70 to 140 feet wide, and it may be supplemented as necessary to form that six-foot opaque feature. As far as environmental aspects go, the applicant's proposing to uh, save 17 and a half acres of wetlands and almost eight acres of uplands. Most of the uplands are in the uh, green ring that forms a buffer along the south boundary, and there's a little bit adjacent to the wetlands, and then the wetlands are all within the uh, center of that uh, those lot areas that you see. As far as dedication improvements, again, we're looking for an easement for the drainage improvements at along 20th Avenue, and we're looking for that easement within 45 days of conceptual plan approval because the county's uh, looking to move forward with bidding that 20th Avenue job, and we need some uh, certainty that uh, we can uh, get our stormwater accommodated. And then secondly, the sidewalks along the thoroughfare plant roads with the 20th Avenue and 27th Avenue need to be constructed prior to the certificate of completion for the job. As far as public benefits, they're listed here. <coughs> the drainage easement is the one, and the <coughs> conservation and wetlands are the other that will be provided with this phase. Uh, and the buffer, the rest have been provided with the previous phases, so the applicant's already done a fair number of these. That gets us to the staff recommendation. The staff does recommend that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend the Board of County Commissioners approve the Falcon Trace PD request with the conditions that's listed in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, questions of staff? Yeah. Um, I may not be able to count, but where's lake number two? There's there's eight there's there's one then three four five six seven and eight is is it just is that a, a, something that's disappeared? Um. Hmm. I noticed that on this I just think they've uh, misnumbered their lakes on the uh, on okay. the plan. That's all. I wasn't sure it wasn't me. Um, Another question with the lakes. They're all interconnected, right? Yes, they're all interconnected with a piping system. Then, so then they yes. would drain southward. Correct. Okay. The, any other questions, John? I, the only thing: did you all in the in your discussions with uh, Scott and the the engineers? I understand. I, I understand what they want to do and kind of the number trade-offs and the benefits. The only thing I am a little concerned about is you got a 55 foot wide lot, and we've gone to 40 percent coverage. When we had 30 percent coverage on a 
the 50 foot lot we get me right where we're allowing a bigger footprint of a house and i i just wish they would address that i don't as to marketability how is it because i mean some of the how one of the complaints we have is these cooker cut cookie cutter homes being crammed together and that's I, my gut tells me my, i'm saying they have one or the other i'm not sure you get both that's that's my feeling Correct. When, you, when you look at just the numbers, if you look at a, a regular small lot subdivision the, and you had a 5,000 square foot lot, the biggest house mm -hmm. you'd be able to build is 1,500 square feet right. based on that 30%. Right. Which is not re realistic in a market, in, the, in a market driven home, I don't think. I, right. That's what, but, but you're giving them a 3,200, 3,000 square foot right. lot. Right. They're now. providing yeah. a, a larger lot and asking for It is a bigger it. lot. It's just tighter, closer together. Slightly larger. <laughs> And also with the PD, they're providing a lot more common open space to offset that the home size on that lot. So they are asking for a little bit bigger. And I'll let them address the marketability. But those are the issues that staff weighed in looking at their requests. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, John, uh, as far as the conservation easement is concerned, what type of vegetation is out there now? What type of maintenance is needed? Who will be in charge of the maintenance? The, the area that is along the south uh, property line is all native upland, and it's a variety of uh, native upland. It's some uh, pine, palmetto, and it's some oak sort of scattered through here, which is similar to the very south end. There's an upland, and then this large area is the wetland. The the maintenance responsibilities will be laid out in the final plat. Those are typically HOA, POA type responsibilities on the final plat that they'll be responsible for maintaining in accordance with the conservation easement that will run to the county and most likely St. John's as well. Thank you. John, um, the um, 9.6 acres of the uh, what St. John's calls the wetland B, which is the big one there, um, that is all protected. That the, that the protection of that 9.6 acres is a requirement of their St. John's permit. Correct. That correct. And that's my understanding. And that's, again, why the applicant is another reason. They were fairly far down the road when their permit ran out. They would had the construction done. They've had they had all their permits in place. The county permit ran out on them. So, yes, it is consistent, is my understanding, with that permit, and it is required. And likewise, the little wetland in the, in the southwest, uh, what, what St. John's calls wetland C, um, that, that 0.4 acres, I, I'm sorry, the, the, the main wetland is 9.22 acres, and the, and the uh, other wetland is 0.4 acres. I think that's where <coughs> that comes, comes in. Um, both of those are are going to be under conservation easement. Is that correct? And is that easement is that easement going to be held by St. John's? Typically, they're held by both the county and St. John's. And that'll be determined at the time of final plat. But with the upland conservation easement, that's a county requirement, and we always have the upland conservation easement. Typically, we have them with the wetlands. We'll have them do it for both. So, the wetlands is a St. John's requirement in addition to the county's requirement. And, the, and St. John's has an upland requirement as well um, that is <coughs> uplands that is immediately adjacent to their wetland. The, the upland edge requirement, correct. Yeah. And so let's say the, the wetland that's in the corner there, um, the small 0.4 acre one, mm -hmm. um, the uplands that are adjacent to that, will they be under conservation easement jointly held by St. John's and the county? Yes, it's my understanding they will be. It's but minor. then the, the southern boundary and the eastern boundary, those uplands, will will that be held just by the county? Because I know that St. John's was not really interested in those in counting those uplands. As Correct, and, and that's the head. native 15% upland set aside that the county would be requiring. And yes, it would be at least the county, and it could be St. John's. And, and again, that's when we get to the language on the final plat, that's where we sort that out. But yes, typically it would be the county okay. only. So I have a question then about the, I'm sorry about this. I have a question about the- Take your time, the just not too yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the, uh, the breakdown on the uplands, we've got seven, uh, 7.3 acres. 
Does that include the two acres that St. John's is requiring as upland edge? It should include the area at the southern end. It should include essentially all the acres that will be under conservation easement. I guess my principal concern is, does it include, I know St. John's is going to require them to plant upland vegetation on graded slopes. Adjacent to. Yeah. Are those planted upland areas going to be counted towards our upland set aside? Does that acreage go into the 7.3? Or is that in addition to? Right. We have it at 7.95, so it's slightly greater. And I'm not sure about the exact boundary, whether the created upland will be part of that conservation easement. That's something I would need to know. Is the created upland being counted towards our native upland set aside? That's my question. And I would need to look closer, but I believe they're over on our native. Maybe Scott or somebody can answer that. If the applicant would come forward. Good evening. My name is Scott McGuire with Knight McGuire and Associates. The upland buffers, just to answer your question, the upland, native upland areas in some cases where they're adjacent to wetlands, yes, they are part of their native upland buffer and they're in the conservation easement. The areas where the wetlands border lots, that entire upland buffer is new and planted within the lots, and it's not part of our native conservation area. So they're two completely different things in those two different instances. Which I think is the correct way it should be, but thank you. All right. Appreciate that. You may, Scott, why don't you wait just because we'll ask you in a minute if you're going to want to speak. You may as well wait for a second. It's my turn. Just about. Any other questions of staff? And if I can follow up just on that point. The point I was trying to look at was overall the seven acres gets us to 25 percent, which is above the county's 15 percent. So we hadn't looked that closely at where the edge was. Okay. Thank you. Scott, would you care to make any presentation or just answer? I've got kind of a tough act to follow there. So I'll be a little briefer. Basically, this is not your typical PD approval that you would normally see here. There's a number of extenuating circumstances here that make it different. Obviously, this is a project that was previously approved through the small lot subdivision process. That ordinance changed just to the extent of the affordable housing criteria, which we cannot meet. I don't know if things keep going the way they are. Maybe we'll eventually be able to meet them. But at this point, and when we were exploring that, no, no way. We weren't that inexpensive. So, you know, we moved on to the PD process in order to foster an approval. The big thing here as I look at this plan is the density is so much lower than any PD I think that's ever been looked at in this county. And we're looking at lot sizes that are greater than what's allowed in the normal, forget small lot subdivision, even the normal RS6. Your density is close to what we would think of RS3. Yeah, and even lower than a lot of PDs in RS3. So, obviously, this isn't a ploy to get more units or anything like that. It's basically just trying to preserve what we previously had approved and not end up running up a whole bunch of costs that don't do anybody any good in changing things and rerouting and redoing. So, you know, we're just asking today for what I believe is a very fair treatment in getting an approval through, you know, a recommendation from you all to the county commission. Fair treatment. Is this part of the new world change? Some other points. All those water management easements have already been recorded. They're required to be recorded when we start development. So, we've got recorded conservation easements over all the wetlands out there. 
uh, when we do final plats, we will record all the native upland and any other uh, specific easements that need to be done. Uh, something else that's not shown on any of this plan or anything else, uh, we do have another site where we did some mitigation in Wabasso that's also a conservation easement that's all dedicated, done, monitored, maintained, uh, all of the above. And then, again, all these conservation easements are part of the POA uh, documents for uh, maintaining in perpetuity, so that's the not an issue. Right now they're being maintained by the developer, but once the plat is done and all the, the homeowners take control of this half, then it then all just falls into the homeowners mm -hmm. uh, as a, ma a, a perpetual maintenance obligation. <coughs> Did you understand the concern I had on the 40%? Yeah, with the smaller, I mean, the lots are bigger, but they're narrow, still narrow, and I'm just, uh, it concerns me when the houses are stacked. It's not It's not the product. It's just that the cookie-cutter approach. Right. Now, and, and I really mean, believe the market will probably change that into the future because you're going to have to come up with some creative demand, you know, creative housing and, right. and whatnot. That's but the, that the and two-story houses that are just stacked next to each a other. A little more tunnels. freedom to do <clears throat> Bigger ground right. floor, one-story houses is all we're, we're looking for. If here. you hadn't gone through what you've already gone through, I probably would object to this. I'm not going to vote against it, but I, that was the only concern, and you, I, you may as well hear it now, mm -hmm. and then I, hopefully you won't make me say I regret this later. Excuse uh, me, Scott, you said something about you're restricting this to one-story homes? No. No. Oh, I thought I heard no. that. For one-story homes, we, with the bigger coverage, we'll have more flexibility in, in moving things right. around and having a bigger one-story house than so going to two-story to get big houses. Okay, I, I have been through the project to the north, and I, and I was wondering if maybe over the last couple of years we've talked about the wedding cake effect on the two-story houses on these small lots. Have you given that any thought? Um, well, the, the unique thing that we do have here is we've got phase one, so you can drive through and see exactly what right. it is we're uh, – proposing here, there hasn't been any change with phase two compared to phase one in any of the design or, or anything like that. I haven't heard any negative comments about how two stories were done in phase one. And, uh, you know, I, so, you know, I'm not prepared to address right. any percentages that's, or anything like and that. And we shouldn't, we really don't, we, okay. we don't have really, unless we put a restriction in, we don't have, that's not something we can, should be looking at anyway, so. Um, any other questions? Yes. Hello? You might as well stand there because you're going to be hopping up and down anyway if I let you sit down. I hope um, not. I, I really have a problem with this proposed trade on the uh, literal zone for the, for the, the wetlands. And, um, and my, my reasoning is basically that I, I, I think since the wetland is, is an on-site mitigation for uh, impacts that have occurred on site. Twelve of the 13 wetlands were, were impacted, and um, and you've done your deal, and you did, a, I mean, the, the job that was done up at Wabasso Scrub Conservation Area is great and ongoing, and I recognize that the off-site mitigation and the on-site mitigation are really good features, but that doesn't sway me to want to waive our literal zone requirements. I think that I think that um, we really should be honoring our own LDRs and, and going ahead and requiring the literal zone requirement in addition to the um, preservation that St. John's is requiring as part of their permitting process. Okay. And that's where I stand on that. Ms. Turner? Um, excuse me, I'm still getting caught up on things here at the, at the commission, but um, when you're Preliminary plat expired on June the, June the 12th. At least my notes say that the county did did inform you all that before, prior to that that they were right. that you would be subject to the new regulations. Yes, oh, we knew years before, and there were other you know circumstances associated with other ordinances that changed related to platting and timing <coughs> and bonding and uh, all that. So the the rules kind of developed after we started construction on phase one. Mm -hmm. Which effectively, the the plat, the preliminary plat in reality expired 18 months before it actually expired. Because if you're not 
well into it and cooking on that development by then, you're never going to make it by the end. And then you're just going to expire while you've got your infrastructure 90 percent done or whatever. So yeah, we we were well aware. Well aware. So if I, Jerry, if I could just ask what, what, Scott, hang on, David, hang, okay. Jerry. Okay, so oh, sorry. Right. Right. Okay, uh, we'll come back. Yeah. The cul-de-sac lots and the corner lots. You're only proposing a five-foot setback, but yet the most corner lots and the cul-de-sac lots seem to be bigger, larger than the other lots, and yet there's less of a setback. Right. Uh, five foot feet was ten feet between the actual structures then on each side. That's kind of close. Right, and the, the reason for that and the reason that was written into the original uh, small lot code is because those cul-de-sac lots, they're shaped like a pie. Right. So up in the front, if you're anywhere near your front setback, you're so squeezed that, um, you know, you, you have need the benefit of that smaller setback. Of course, as you work your way back, the average Why? setback is going to be much in excess of, of what your uh, normal setback would be because you don't have parallel lines. So you end up with a lot more green space between those, even though there's a five-foot setback instead of a ten. Well, but it's possible that you could shape the house to conform to the to a V-shape, and you would have the five foot all the way. Right. You, that, and that's true. the other thing would be, is there any consideration when you have such a small setback that you make sure that the windows and adjacent houses don't line up? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how. I mean, you don't have much that model homes yet or anything yeah, planned. Because there is no instance out there where they do a five foot setback and set it parallel to the line and do another house five foot setback. And there's no parallel ten foot houses separation there. They're always twisted and turned so that there's much more than five feet between them. Uh, so that doesn't really become an issue. All right. Now, the other thing would be the cul-de-sacs. Uh, now, the obvious ones are okay, but let's say in the um, southwest corner, is that considered a cul-de-sac, that little turn in there? That would be considered a cul-de-sac. So those would all be cul-de-sacs. Okay. okay. David. Scott, with the open space that you've got, um, that, that are, that's being proposed here, being above the, the minimum. <coughs> um, Excuse me. Would the provision of literal zones? I mean, you'd, you'd have to obviously do some redesigning, um, but would it be possible to include the literal zones, well, given that you do have a? It would. It would certainly be space? possible. The big issue with literal zones is the price we pay for them, because we're very short on dirt out here. We've already moved. A bunch of dirt. So, the the dirt we don't yield out of the lakes at this point would be. I mean, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's millions of dollars if we have to do the literal zones. The other big issue is having to go back and, and re-permit um, for permits that have not yet expired. St. John's permit specifically <clears throat> to go back and redo all that uh, could change some things that we don't understand yet. So we're trying to avoid that also. Just, Scott, just has anything changed? What we've got. Were you originally approved without having to provide the literal zones? Original approval had no literal zones. Okay. No. Thank mm -hmm. you. That ordinance came into place after the approval. Okay. So this is basically what was approved before you're just having yes. to come back under the PD? Yes. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Um, with if, if you're not going to be doing any kind of literal zones, um, it seems like you would want some kind of, of landscaping amenities around the lakes just for aesthetics, or are you going to leave that up to the homeowners? I mean, it seems got, like some cypress trees or maples or bays. Yeah, I mean, there's, there is kind of a mixed feeling about that. When you go to Public Works, they don't like trees and stuff along the slopes. You've got your lake maintenance easements that you have to keep clear. Uh, so it's kind of been a policy to, for us in this project to follow Public Works lead and keep it clear around the lake so that it can be maintained easier. We wrestle with that in here about what we'd like to see right. versus yeah. how the mowers run. Just so. encouraging yeah. it. One, one more comment on a bit on the lighter side. Seeing with the vacant lots in phase two in the original development, 
um, and I realize it takes time to get everything moving. Do you know something about the economy that I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, basically, as you look at that aerial, that aerial was taken about a year or a year and a half ago, and on that you can see that most of them are built out. I think we're at 30 or 40 percent left, and we've been chunking away at that. And right now we're looking at a lead time at, you know, minuscule sales even that we have of, you know, needing to get started within the next year or so in order to be ready for homes as that side finishes out. Okay. So we we it's, it's a lot of lead time, but it's coming. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I just thought maybe Okay. This is a Thank public you. hearing. The public hearing is open for comment if anyone cares to come down. Uh, public hearing is now closed. Um, gentlemen, we need to take actions. I think that in all candor, this is this is probably, he's right in the sense that this is something that's already, I won't say the cart's out of the, with the, and the horse is gone, but it's, this is, this is something that's been previously put in place. I, I'm, you know, there's some concerns here. I think that maybe if this was a brand new project, it, it may not get, get quite okay. as far along, but I think that in fairness, they, they, they do have a low density. It uh, it's, uh, fits nicely with the one next door. So at any rate, we need a motion for or against the staff's recommendation and or any other amendments. I have a motion to approve it with the staff recommendation. Delar, thank you. Anyone I'll else? Second it. Jerry, I'll second it. All, any, just more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. One opposed. David. Dr. Cox. Okay, thank you. All right, Scott. Next item is uh, Quail Ridge PD. This was uh, an earlier project that came up. It's next to Quail Valley. It's a request for PD special exception use and conceptual PD plan approval for an agricultural PD to be known as Quail Ridge. Uh, Quail Ridge of Vero Beach LLC owner. Okay. Big John, rock on. Thank you, Mr. Hamner. This is a request for special exception use approval, and the reason why is because, again, they're modifying the zoning code to go less than the 200,000 square foot lot size that's required in the agricultural district, and they need to be consistent with land use policy 5.8, which also requires that it go through the PD process, and that's what they're doing. As part of the special exception process, again, it's a two public hearing process. We've sent out letters, we've advertised it, we put signs on the site. As far as the location, it is immediately west of the Quail Valley Golf Course. It's outside the urban service area and it is zoned agricultural A1 as is all the area around it zoned agricultural A1. This is an aerial of the site and it, again it shows the subject site, shows the golf course Quail Valley and shows that the majority of the area surrounding it is agricultural. At the time this area was taken, mostly groves. At the time this area was taken, the subject site had a lot of grove on it. As was commented, and there is a little history on this site, it was a previously proved as a five-acre ranchette. They got a land development permit. They went out there. So if you looked at it today, the site's been modified somewhat um, to conform to that land development permit, but though they stopped when the county started to explore a policy 5.8 and changing the uh, plan development regulations to allow uh, smaller lots outside the urban service area and uh, consistent with policy 5.8. So they redesigned uh, to, uh, to change to conform to policy 5.8 more out of a, I think, a market move and a move to do something more interesting and innovative outside of the urban service area rather than do five acre ranchettes. And this is the design that's proposed. It's 203 acres, uh, it's 40 units, it's just under 0.2 units per acre, which is a lower density than the previous subdivision for PD. So there are some low density subdivisions out there. Storm water on the site. As far as the Before, let me ask you a quick question. I wouldn't interrupt you except that having looked at this, everything is the same size. And I, I do remember very clearly and dearly in this argument on this lots that these lots were going to be 
one acre, five acre, ten acre. It was multi sizes, not, not all the same size. And so, at some point, maybe our chairman of our growth committee that did this can explain to me what happened later. You, you, you're talking about for the design that was proposed. Well, um, just the whole. We had to change. This was a this was a major LDR change. Correct. In the Ag PD, and and this is. I'm just remember the rule change itself. So it allows for much greater flexibility. That that and was correct. A variety of lot sizes, whereas under the agricultural right. subdivision, this this, this not this meets the criteria. I'm not right. that's not but okay. just file that away. All right. As far as the stormwater goes, there is a a large a single lake out there. It's actually connected through the subdivision through through the lots in two places, and the stormwater is treated in the lake and then outfalls to the north. As far as uh, traffic circulation, the roadway connects to 69th Street, which is at the north end, and then there's a very long cul-de-sac, as would be needed. Again, it's very low density, so <coughs> longer cul-de-sacs are allowed. As far as proposed PD waivers, they're looking at reducing the lot size, 200,000, which was required under the old code, as far as zoning goes, uh, reducing it to essentially one and a half acres. And that's the only waiver that the applicant's requesting. All of the setbacks, all of the other A1 zoning district criteria would need to be met. As far as PD issues, and these are a lot of the issues that are rolled into uh, policy 5.8, and we spelled out policy 5.8 in, uh, in your staff report. They need to provide uh, BMPs, which is best management practices, and we're looking at those on a variety of things, and we're still uh, learning about BMPs ourselves because uh, they are uh, changing and evolving as, as folks learn more and more. Uh, they did meet policy 5.8, which one of the criteria is there's no nuisance recreation. In other words, you can't do a planned development and dedicate part of your uh, development towards a, a, a motorcycle track or something like that. You can't uh, do a large lake and then have uh, jet ski races, things like that. So uh, the common open space needs to be dedicated in perpetuity. So that will be taken care of again with the final plat is when that all gets wrapped up and how that gets wrapped up. And then one of the general things is we've, in all of our ag PDs, looked to restrict <coughs> the fruit fly host plants, and that's also a, a thing that they'll need to uh, meet. As far as environmental, it was an old grove. There was a pond on the site. Uh, not a whole lot of environmental value in that particular grove end of it. They're looking at creating seven and a half acres of littoral zone. It'll essentially be on the opposite side of the lake, away from the resident's backyard, coming down this side and a little bit in the other sections of the lake. And then essentially 35 acres of created upland is what they're proposing. And again, we'll get more details on those as we get to the preliminary plat stage. You all will see the preliminary plat. It'll come back before you all. With that, I'd like to get to the staff recommendation. Staff does recommend that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend the board approve the Quail Ridge PD with the uh, conditions as listed by staff. Thank you. Any uh, questions of staff? Yeah. Um, I don't remember from, from a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, when we were, when the sand mine issue was coming up and 69th being a major haul route, is um, there any uh, <coughs> process for notification of potential buyers um, so they are fully aware that the 69th is a major haul route for dump trucks? There's not that provision in place. And again, as you look at sand mines, I wouldn't necessarily say they're a, a temporary use, but they are an interim use of land where that use mm -hmm. does sunset. So, again, it depends on what stage you would buy at as to what, how actively 69th Street would it be being used. Well, I, at, I mean, least, I, at least three mines and, and with a minimum of 10-year lifespan. It, it, I, if I was looking at buying there, I would want to know that. At some point, I, the only thing, Gen Z, at some point, People do have, need to do their own due diligence. I mean, and they can see the mines from there, I believe, or yeah, we're close to it. So. Any other? Oh, Jerry, I'm sorry. But Obviously, there's going to be some sand mining on this property. Will that be all kept on site, or will that be 
off-site. The applicant can verify this, but it's my understanding that they're not looking at exporting any sand, and they may be actually looking at potentially possibly importing sand, but they can confirm that. But that's my understanding, that they wanted to get a lot of topography and a lot of relief to the site. Because, I mean, there's a lot of lakes here. There's going to be obviously a lot of digging. Correct. And my understanding is they generally. Basically on-site. Again, that's my understanding at this point. They can confirm that. That's what they're saying back there. Okay. There's a place down on 20th we just talked about that said they needed dirt, so that's. All right. Any other questions of staff? I just have one question. Does this project require an emergency entrance? It does not, and the fire department criteria is more than 100 units. So you get a very large geographic piece like this that is fairly low density, not requiring an emergency access point. Okay. Thank you. I have one question, then we'll get the applicant back up. But we have dropped to one and a half acres, which is about 65 or 66,000 square feet, down from 200,000 square feet. And that is allowed consistently in the new ordinance? Okay. I keep thinking of this variability that we had, but okay. Well, there's some variability in here. Yeah, there is. Some lots that are in the 80s. Okay. Would the applicant care to speak? Good evening. Scott McGuire with Knight McGuire & Associates. This one's been a long time in coming. As John mentioned, this site was previously approved as an active exemption grid pattern, five-acre lots. Actually, I remember a picture of a golf course in various size lots at the time, but it didn't work out, I guess. I know there's no golf course proposed. I noticed that. It was a nine-hole, wasn't it? Yeah, I think. The extra nine holes. But what we do have here is with the reduction in lot size, it opens up our land budget to do a lot of other things, which basically rather than having little five-acre parcels with their own little lakes and all the things that we've seen on these subdivisions that have been done, now we've got the freedom of moving things around. Now we've got some lakes that will be maintained by POAs. We've got some native upland habitat to establish, which is going to be a challenge in itself. You know, taking just bare dirt and creating native upland. So that's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be easy. I know we planted the grove. I know the dirt. And then, Dave, you get your literal zones on this one. So there will be quite a few plants being imported to make this all happen. But I feel that it's a really wonderful thing to have the freedom to do these things on these ag PDs now because the five-acre grid was getting kind of old. And I really prefer the ability to do it this way. I think it's going to be a much better project. It will be able to be maintained by a property owners association. It will be private. So there's no county maintenance. There's no road grading. We're paving the road. There's none of the things that you might see with some of these other projects. And I think it pretty much speaks for itself. So I'll just stand by to answer questions that anybody may have specific to the design. Is there a – with an ag PD, you will be allowed to hook up with water and sewer, correct? Yes, that's part of the request. Is that part of the – Not sewer. Just water? Just water. Oh, it's just water you get to hook up. Right. Scott, where is that hookup for the water? It's way down the road. We're right now working through all the numbers and whatnot associated with bringing the water all the way out there. But we've got to do a master plan line all the way to 58th Avenue, out 69th, all the way out, loop it back all the way around and come in 53rd and tie in back where they're building the school. So it ends up being two and a half or three miles. So you're coming out of your southeast corner? Yes. Going back through Quail Valley, the south end? Wow. All the way down that 
Indian River Farms and Sebastian hmm. Drainage District right away. And there so it's, a lot. it's a big, it's a big program to get one. Scott, are there there are existing um, permitted um, wells on site, are there not? Uh, deep wells? Yeah. There's there's only one or two. One that I'm aware of, is, and it's relatively small. I think it's only a four, four or six four inches. Four or six inches, probably. Yeah, it's a relatively small one. Will that be capped? That we'll use to supplement the lakes. Uh, we'll be doing reuse system out here and setting our controls a little bit higher so when it rains we hold that water back and use it to irrigate so you're going to need a lot of water for the right. for that 27 acres of uplands you're going to create as well yeah and what the program there is to to get it established and yeah and then turn it, it off i mean it'll take it'll take years but it will <coughs> be a perpetual user of water is, mr chairman scott as far as the upland that you're going to create do you have any idea of what was there before orange grove there's probably was mostly slash pine. Pine, mm -hmm. pine plant woods. Mm -hmm. go back pretty far in the Yeah, I, I, the thing was planted back in about 1960, if I remember, 58. Aside from plantings, this will be maintained by the Homeowners Association afterwards? Yes. Have the developers pointed to other projects similar to this where the maintenance of 30 something acres of uplands been successfully maintained and it's worked in the past that you don't come up with just a bunch of brazilian pepper that has overgrown everything that's why i say it's going to be challenged this is not this is a, a new program it, as far as i know certainly in this county it's never been done to this scale this is the, so this is the first one right so basically the the general idea is to treat the uplands more or less like uh, all the, if, as you drive through Orlando now on the uh, turnpike where all those old citrus groves froze out back in the 80s mm -hmm. they turn those into uh, pulpwood uh, areas and they plant their trees in rows well those slash pines are readily available at a reasonable price where we can go out and plant those not in rows but scattered about and then supplement with some oaks and we're hoping to be able to do that in a manner that it's relatively inexpensive and all the other stuff doesn't come in so that's the that's the challenge to get those established well enough you know obviously the first five years is going to be a lot of maintenance as time goes on it should go down 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 till there's virtually no maintenance on the upland well scott what what kind of ground cover are you even dreaming about not uh, sod I would hope for the yeah there, there won't be any sod ground cover associated with the, the upland areas Maybe. if anything at all it would just be trash mulch um, you're probably one-time application and and there'll be different things we try uh, and see what works best hey. uh, you know the and, and I know a lot of those areas and I'm not that familiar with uh, you know how these slash pines or what kind of maintenance you need on them but I do know when they put them out there for forestry purposes <coughs> they certainly don't have irrigation systems and that type of thing no and they don't put ground cover on and they manage to keep all that noxious stuff from growing so well, it's, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. By no, the way. It's, no, it's not. I mean, we, what you'd be talking about in a regular forestry situation would be, you know, pine seedlings that would be put in with a planting machine or a dibble bar. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, they're planted up north, where you don't have the problem with the invasion of the exotics that you would here. Um, is, is there any st uh, timeline that's required? Uh, size limits that you're going to require of them? Or are they going is there to be a definition for this conservation area? Would be another way of looking at it. What we're doing is we're going to be looking at additional details as it comes in for the preliminary plat. We'll get more detail. Land development permit. We'll get more detail. But this is what the applicant's been talking about all along: is recreating kind of a pine slash wood, a slash pine wood forest, uh, maybe using hay straw, other, as Scott put it, trash mulch to essentially keep out some of the nuisance exotics. Again, they realize that there's a commitment to going in and maintaining, especially in the early period, 
to keep out those nuisance exotics. But we think that's one of the actual benefits of this development as it's going forward uh, to take something that uh, is growth and try to get it back to something that it was originally. And you know, that's the key and what we're hoping the applicant do, can do is to get it back to uh, more of a native balance to where it will essentially balance itself and eventually require less maintenance. So we're looking at it, we're continuing along with the BMPs to get more detail as it goes further through the process, but it's something we want to see happen. Projects trying to do this sort of thing are, are I wouldn't say common, but they're known across the country, conservation subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And I think, Stan, you've even provided in like four years ago, there, there, you provided in backup some examples of these from different parts of the country. I know I'm familiar with them in Illinois and New York. Um, and I'm not familiar with any of them in our region. So this is uh, an experiment. It is. And, and the applicant is working with the National Audubon Society, and they've indicated that they're hoping to seek certification as an Audubon certified. So they're, they have some input, and they're, they're looking. And again, it's a, a lot of work, and it may be some trial and error, but they're looking at, at attempting to do that. Okay. Any other questions? Scott, thank you. Thank you. Does uh, anyone else in your group care to be heard? If not, we'll open the public hearing anyway. Public hearing is open. Would anyone in the public care to speak? Good evening. Joseph Paladin. I am the chairman of the Growth Awareness Committee. And uh, I will address your question now. Uh, Jeff, they said if you walked on water, they'd say you couldn't swim, buddy. <laughs> uh, we do have a very, uh, various size of lots here. Our smallest, our smallest lot is about uh, 1.6 acres, and the largest lot is around 3 acres. And at the time that we brought the changes through on 5.8, there was a lot of discussion as to uh, we'd have a limit on the size of the lots or we wouldn't right. have a limit on the size of the lots. And I remember Commissioner Wheeler wanted to say, you know, it would be under 4 acres. So these are of various size, but you've got to realize that on a lot this size, where you're talking about building a house on a three-acre lot, even though all the lots look similar on this drawing, you're not going to be able to tell that when this project's completed. Because, uh, you know, on a three-acre lot, you're going to build a house that's going to be set back here. On the 1.6-acre lot, it'll be set up here. You have a lot of variances where you can build your houses. So looking at this, they're not going to be, like, fenced off. So you won't be able to even tell that these lots are even close to being similar in size. So that's one of the reasons why we got, got away with this design. If it was smaller, where all the lots were exactly one acre, then you might have a little bit more of a problem. But I think you're going to have enough of variance with this, you won't have that. So okay. that's how we got to this design. I see. But okay. we, it did conform to our intent when we designed this. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else in the public care to speak? If not, public hearing is closed. Uh, a motion or any further discussion? Well, I think it's nice to see an LDR change actually before us and where we've seen the before and the after, and we see that this one works. And I, uh, I move approval with staff recommendations. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item. Commissioner's matters. Anybody on the commission other than cheers and welcomes? Anybody care for any comments? Yeah, on anything? George, in the in the backup that staff provided, um, the magazine articles and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, there was a thing about the citrus industry and um, comments from <laughs> somebody. Um, I didn't know that 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 particular stretch controlled the citrus industry. Well, that's uh, in the state. I've, I've never heard of, of anybody from the Indian River Citrus region trying to ship their fruit over there to get it <laughs> sold. It's always been them trying to ship their fruit over here. The wonders never cease. <laughs> um, any, any other comments from the commissioners? Uh, planning matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just uh, give you all a, a quick update on uh, some items of interest that have occurred since your last meeting. Of course, uh, the Gators won another national championship since your last meeting. Uh, that's important. 
Uh, the Board of County Commissioners <laughs> approved two LDR amendments that you all had made recommendations on, the commercial vehicles and residential areas and the mining regulations. And just to give you all an update, uh, staff has heard from only one of the applicants so far, the three that were in the pipeline, while Turkey came in to meet to go over changes they would need to make to their application uh, to come back in. Uh, we have met with them, but we have not received a, uh, any sort of revised application at this point in time. And the other item is that this last Tuesday, the Board of County Commissioners approved the Sunnyside Up plan development that you all had recommended approval on. Uh, so uh, we, we may see that going forward at some point in time. And okay. that's all that I had. Thank you. Uh, attorneys matters? None. All right. We stand adjourned. We're out of here. Good job.